Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, my name is Greg Ganley. I'm a uh, mobile security researcher at MITRE, um, principal investigator working on IMAS, iOS Mobile Application Security. So just to give you a quick background about what is uh, MITRE, we're a nonprofit company. We work in the public interest. Uh, we don't manufacture products, uh, essentially uh, enabling us to provide conflict-free conflict guidance. We operate several, several FFRDCs, what are called federally funded research development centers for the DOD, the FAA, the IRS, uh, various organizations. Uh, with Inside MITRE, we have an independent uh, research and development program, and essentially we're doing look-ahead research for our sponsors, and IMAS uh, comes under this. Um, we're in the second year of our research uh, with IMAS. So real quick, if I were to get on a quick elevator ride with you, I would say that IMAS is uh, a iOS application defense, and then expanding that a little bit, we're a secure open source application framework to reduce application vulnerabilities and information loss. So let me give you a little bit of background on uh, iOS security. Um, in general, you could say that it has four layers, the device, data, network, and application layers. Um, inside of iOS security, in, the, the security of iOS itself, uh, they've actually done a really good job um, um, over, over, the, over the years. It, it, it has gotten better. But just looking at um, uh, the, the OS itself, they actually have a pretty, They've reduced the attack surface as much as possible by not having uh, Java or Flash. They've stripped down a lot of their system apps uh, as compared to those same apps running on full-blown Mac OS, uh, OS X. Um, there's a smaller footprint in that when, if one did get uh, root access um, to the device, there's no shell, there's, there's no commands in the shell to manipulate. Uh, unlike Android, when you, you get into um, to a rooted, when you root an uh, Android device, you, you have all that at, at your fingerprint, uh, fingertips. Um, there's also various, uh, they have the code signing, basically uh, pages in memory and all that stuff. So they do a lot to, to, um, to make the security uh, much more enhanced uh, right out of the box. Uh, their model definitely is comprehensive and it has evolved. Uh, recently, iOS 6 um, was granted uh, PIPs 140 2 compliance, approved uh, government use. This means that uh, more and more government uh, agencies are likely going to be uh, building custom apps now that they have this FIPS approval, because that's one of the, the wickets they need to get through uh, in order to uh, field these, which also means there's more need uh, for iOS application security, and in particular, uh, IMS. So just to scope where our research is coming from, um, you know, the iOS attack surface is multifaceted. The threat vectors uh, can be anything from a lost, stolen device where one can have physical access. Um, and then there's malware that can be inserted, perhaps uh, by the browser JavaScript engine, and then more recently, we're seeing uh, enterprise apps um, as a vector. And that's because essentially um, developers who are building iOS apps for enterprise are sometimes grabbing uh, code off the web um, from the open source community. Some of it is not well vetted and perhaps has some malware inside. So that's another way to, uh, for malware to get onto these devices. And if you look at an attacker's purpose, they're, they're looking to steal application data, find enterprise credentials, eavesdrop on the video, microphone, and phone calls. And then the other scariest uh, one is the command and control uh, recon to kind of get back into the enterprise network. Essentially use it as a, a foothold to get back into your enterprise. So for IMAS, we're focusing on um, the application use and its data as the target. Uh, and that's enterprise data, tactical operational data, if the military were to field these and, and uh, field these devices, give them to soldiers. Uh, we want to try to protect that data. And finally, you know, patient health information is another uh, aspect that we're looking to, to uh, uh, help lock down. And we want to try to protect against malware and physical access attacks. And really, that's um, securing with st a static and then dynamic application controls is the focus of IMS. So if you look at... Um, hacking and jailbreaking in iOS. Um, the attacks are well documented. Um, uh, John Jartsky's book on the left uh, from O'Reilly and then Dino Daisovi, um, Miller, and, and a bunch of other folks there. It's, there's a bunch of well, well documented ways to get into, uh, into, the I, into, into iOS and then into applications. The talk right before me was a great talk that, talked, that went into the specifics of how easy it is to um, you know, reverse it and then do your method swizzling and all that. Um, there's, 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 uh, there are jailbreaks. I uh, haven't heard of uh, jailbreaks for iOS 7 just yet that is untethered ones. But in iOS 6, uh, when that came out, there was uh, really prominent ones, uh, evasion. And then, you know, once the device is jailbroken, um, 
Uh, Dino Daisovi put this slide up uh, back a, a couple of years ago at Black Hat, where essentially if you have a four-digit passcode and it's numeric, um, one can uh, you know, put a brute force uh, program on the iOS uh, jailbroken device, run it real quickly, and within, uh, at max, you know, he, on an iPhone 4, he found that it took 18 minutes to crack a, a passcode. And it gets longer and longer as your passcodes get more complex. But um, with uh, a large majority of folks not having passcodes, and even if they do, they're only four digits, it's a, a real simple uh, way to get around there. Of course, once you have the passcode, you now have the key to uh, unlock the device, unlock data protection on the device, which now gives access to the data around these applications. So, you know, kind of summarizing that together, um, if you look at a standard iOS app today, there's vulnerabilities, that being the four-digit passcode, I just talked about that. And then you look at the various system components. Kind of once, you, once you're in, uh, one can, uh, if a device is jailbroken, you can then have root access. The, the, the memory itself, uh, the debugger, uh, is a way to get a hold of, uh, of your device and then your application itself. Um, and then, of course, user, user authentication and application access. If you don't build this into your app, you have to, you're using the OS, uh, which really there's not much available for you to do that. Um, so that's an area where one could expand on. And then finally, the keychain and flash uh, data storage. Again, so once you have this passcode, you can access the keychain and you can access um, the flash data storage. So there's, there's the, the, the um, you know, kind of the vulnerabilities are somewhat numerous. And um, so here's, here's what we're trying to do with the IMAS Secure Application Framework. There's a lot on this slide, but essentially we're, we're looking at uh, providing um, somewhat of an application container. It's not a build on the fly, um, single library kind of thing. It's a series of um, individual security controls that developers can uh, download and use uh, from GitHub because we've open sourced. Um, so we're basically taking these security controls beyond Apple iOS. We're trying to reduce that iOS app attack surface. Um, and these are vetted, prioritized sec security controls, and I'll talk about that. Um, and like I said, it's open source, and we're trying to grow that open source community. Um, so the takeaway here is that um, we have a whole bunch of different controls that I'm going to talk about. Um, and as, uh, as this, as this uh, research year goes on, we're going to keep adding into, diff into more of those controls that I'll talk about. And these are the various uh, security areas. So if you look at um, where IMAS sits in the application stack, this, this uh, graphic was taken right out of the um, security document that was published by Apple. And if you look, um, essentially, um, the stack in Apple is fairly closed off. Uh, unlike Android, there's many different ways that you can kind of hook in and add your security or, or add to or embellish your security. Uh, with, with iOS, you pretty much, uh, the area has to be within the application level, uh, and that's where we fit right up in the app sandbox. Uh, a few years ago, MITRE put together a, uh, a report for the Department of Defense CIO, and, and, it, and it basically went into um, describing all the various mobile threats that are out there. So MITRE did a pretty good job of categorizing uh, the various mobile threats there from so their software-based, their web-based, network-based, um, there's physical-based threats, enterprise, and of course, user-based. If you look at all of these, um, IMS is applicable, applicable to about half of these, uh, 12 or so. Um, which is pretty good. I mean, there's some that are network-based, and we're, we're, again, we're focusing on the application itself. If, if, uh, you know, speaking of OWASP, um, the OWASP Mobile Top 10, we cover six of these uh, of the Mobile Top 10, insecure data storage, uh, poor authentication, uh, authorization and authentication, uh, broken cryptography, um, security decisions, and then sensitive information disclosure. So we're trying to cover as many of those as possible as well. With, um, if you look at IMAS and what we're trying to do, uh, we have a graph here that talks about the number of security controls on the left. So my, my claim is that the more security controls you add to your application, the uh, more secure um, your app becomes. And the spectrum can go from consumer to enterprise to what I'm calling enterprise plus, and then you can get into the classified space. So um, the yellow box is kind of where we're at with iOS 6 today. Um, uh, that that uh, that first black dot there. And then if you add a mobile, a mobile device management system or uh, um, a manager, or you, and, and then you add perhaps an app container. We, we heard those at the last talk, but there's Good, there's Mokana, there's a couple out there. Uh, you're going to add additional uh, security controls that are going to bring you closer and closer. But as the last talk just talked about, there are a lot of ways to get around these app containers. Um, and so 
I'm saying if you want to, if you want to make, you know, essentially increase the security of your application, take a look at IMAS and take a look at the controls we have. And by adding them to your app, we're going to raise it up to the point that you could get closest to this enterprise plus, plus level and have a much uh, higher level of assurance. We haven't looked at iOS 7 just yet. Um, it's, um, if, if folks have developed an iOS before um, out there, iOS 7 itself, um, th there's a lot you have to do to change over your tool sets, uh, up, up rev your, uh, your OS, et cetera. So we're going to get there, but we haven't got there just yet. How many iOS developers are, in, are here today? Oh, great. So let's take a look at the security controls. Um, just kind of bouncing around, starting on the top left, uh, the device access. So I talked about the four-digit passcode. We have a security control called passcode check. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but essentially allows, uh, the de allows a developer to, um, uh, <clears throat> to confirm that there is a four-digit passcode or even a complex passcode on the device. Application access, um, iOS doesn't, doesn't provide any, any way to essentially put a password, so you often have to build it yourself. This is a control where a developer could quickly add an app password to the app. Data at rest, the keychain and core data um, are vulnerable areas. Uh, and so we have a control called encrypted core data, um, secure foundation, which is essentially an open SSL uh, port onto iOS. And uh, we're also looking at um, uh, MDM remote control. Runtime, uh, the RAM and debugger, jailbreak root access, we have a, a security check control one could add uh, that gets into jailbreaking and debugger, debugger attachment detection. Um, we have a memory security control, and then we're researching encrypted RAM disk this year. App tampering, we have this notion of uh, forced inlining. So uh, as folks know, um, inlining uh, functions is a good thing, uh, and so we have a security control that talks about that as well. Um, and then uh, several others were doing research. In terms of data in transit, that's somewhat out of scope. Uh, that is out of scope for IMAS. But we, we, I looked around and actually found uh, a, a great GitHub repository, SSL Conservatory. Uh, these folks have a, um, a really nice kind of tutorial way to do SSL cert pinning. Um, and that's at least one step closer to having a, a, a more secure network uh, connection. So just talking about each one in particular, um, so starting with the passcode check, th this is uh, a programmatic library and a method to enforce device code passcode use. Essentially on iOS, uh, there, is, there isn't a library that a developer could call that says, has the user set their passcode? And if so, is it, is it a four digit, 10 digit, is it complex? Uh, because I, you'd like to be able to you know, have your app change its behavior based on that um, decision. Uh, so anyways, we provide this, um, you know, it's a tutorial, it's also a, uh, a security control that one can you know, compile in and follow along. Um, the research there took a little while to kind of piece it all together, what was out there. But it's, it's actually pretty interesting. Um, the app password itself, um, we have a secure, simple, user resettable password to protect. Um, and essentially, if you go out and look for app passwords uh, up on GitHub or other open source areas, there are some out there. But if you look in the background, it's, it, they're mostly a, a user interface. Because in the back, they're, they, they usually just go to um, you know, a class method that they're, they're setting the password. And they kind of leave the whole storage of the password uh, up to the developer. Uh, we actually get into the behind the scenes where we're, where we're uh, encrypting it properly and um, not storing it on the device. And we, we, we're using OpenSSL. We're not using data protection or um, uh, the um, iOS keychain. Um, uh, key so that's a great one to look at. Encrypted core data is one where um, if you look at core data today, if you, you, can, you can actually select that you'd like the data to be stored in a flat file or you'd like it to be stored in a database. That database is SQLite. Um, the SQLite library that's compiled into core data uh, just stores it in plain text. Um, so if one uh, has the passcode, gets into the device, they can find these SQLite files and easily uh, pull them back to their laptops and peruse and look through all the data. So what we've done is we've actually, um, we've actually created our own core data API that's similar to core data, and um, we've compiled in uh, SQL Cipher, which is an open source uh, way to compile or a shim that goes above SQLite. And so that particular control is getting a lot of traction uh, out, on the, out, on the, um, out on GitHub. And it's one that people find you know, somewhat easy to use and we're, getting, we're starting to get more of the community to develop. Security check is a simple way to do jailbreak and debugger detection. And we have a lot of 
anti-forensic techniques in there, uh, using C macros, um, nameless function blocks, uh, inline methods. Uh, that's something that um, folks find useful. Secure Foundation, where we've taken OpenSSL crypto and we bundled that, made it easier for developers to grab and make use of. We've also grabbed the FIPS version of it and compiled that. Um, so a lot of this is, is, is the use cases, um, uh, the security requirements come in on your application and the developer is asked to do these, you know, meet these requirements. The developer is somewhat left um, to figure this out and, and develop uh, on the fly. Uh, here we're hoping they can kind of come to our site come to GitHub, take a look at the particular controls and, um, and see how, they, how these controls are done and then incorporate them more easily. I wonder if um, this, this uh, laptop has um, internet access. No, it doesn't. Okay, so I was gonna click and kind of show you um, what the site looks like, but we'll do that later. So memory security, here's one where if you have a, um, uh, a if you have sensitive information, so I'm not saying store a password in here, but it's the idea that the RAM is also a place where um, you know the forensics folks or a, a bad actor can actually take a snapshot of your RAM of your app, and then they can peruse it using strings or whatever to find sensitive information. Like let's say patient health information. Let's say you had an app that um, stored your patient health information, including your name, social security number, um, kind of critical medical records. You, you have that stored in using encrypted core data inside of a SQLite file that's encrypted, but you pull it up and display it to the user. That time that it's in transit or in memory, perhaps you want to store some of that sensitive information encrypted uh, so that the only time it's um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the clear is at the stack level versus at the heap level. Um, so that makes it harder for that snapshot to take place. So here's, um, and this was a little bit of a challenge because of ARC uh, on uh, Objective-C uh, and, and kind of the way it manages memory and whatnot. So anyways, this is a, a really interesting anti-tamper technique. Forced inlining um, is a recent one we just added up there a few weeks ago. And the idea is that um, you know, inlining code uh, from a, uh, a, a, a you know, somewhat of a, a, a code reuse perspective is not a good thing, right? You don't want to make, uh, the whole point of a compiler is to try to make your uh, executable as concise as possible. But inlining is actually a great way from a security perspective to kind of place information uh, in, multiple, in multiple places throughout the code without, and to actually truly duplicate it. And so we, have a, we actually have a tutorial and uh, uh, some techniques up there on how to do it with Objective-C. Um, and again, this is challenging because there's a, there's a lot to it that, that one has to do, uh, and there's, a, there's several um, optimization settings one has to figure out. So um, we have all this up on uh, GitHub to see, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna drill down into that in a minute uh, in another slide or two. So available today on GitHub, all these different controls, um, we have uh, eight of them up there, app password, uh, passcode check, that list. And then we also have taken a look at uh, Remail, and it's, it's an application that Google um, purchased a few years ago. It's open source. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, we also have some recent MDM remote control research. Stuff that we're working on now is we're wrapping up our secure MDM remote control research. We're um, looking at encrypted code modules. Um, and that's the idea that if you have an app that is um, uh, on the device, and it's susceptible to uh, a, a bad actor if, if they have a hold of your iPad. The bad actor could take the app, pull it onto their, um, their laptop, and run IDA Pro on this and reverse the app back to C code, then take a look at all your, all your algorithms and figure out what, what you're doing. So what we're doing with encrypted code modules is, is we, we'd like the developer to identify um, critical areas of code, maybe one that uh, does a lot of your security work, and actually um, place that into a, a dynamic library, and then we'll encrypt the dynamic library um, so that when the app is now at rest, uh, not run, not being run, um, there's, there could be uh, portions of it that are just this encrypted blob. So if a bad actor grabbed the code, pulled it back to their, their, uh, their laptop, ran IDA Pro on it, they'd, um, they'd decompile the fact that, and could see a bunch of the, the way the UI is run, but when they want to look at uh, particular security areas, they would be, that would be encrypted. Um, and so the question is, is you know, uh, our research is going to look into how much of the app can we encrypt. Um, now, obviously, anytime we talk dynamic libraries, this can't uh, go up on the app store. Again, our focus is really that enterprise customer um, that is building these apps for uh, their their particular business, um, and they're using you know uh, solutions where they have custom app stores. 
So in the future, we want to look at uh, encrypted RAM disk, kind of um, having a way in memory to uh, store sensitive information, kind of that's transient. Um, dynamic app bundling, a fancy way to say, you know, basically take uh, IMAS, uh, bundle it as a container, and try to add it on the fly, um, like some commercial products. But this would be an open source solution, so one could, you know, enjoy uh, and look at all the details of how it's done and do your own solution if you'd like. And then off device trust, we'd like to experiment with um, uh, the lightning connector and, and perhaps the whole notion where you've seen folks, uh, I don't know if folks have been to Black Hat this last summer, but they had a, um, it was a great talk where these folks uh, actually connect, connected a, um, a USB charger to an iPad, exploited the USB interface and uh, did all kinds of stuff um, like actually taking an app, pulling it back to their, their little uh, remote, char their little charger and uh, uh, wrapped, basically wrapped the Facebook app in this little Trojan app and then pushed it all back. So when you ran Facebook first, their app ran, which was recording all the keystrokes that you were typing, uh, and then Facebook popped up so the user was, wasn't susceptible, you know, didn't know what was happening at all. Anyways, we're going to look into different ways to how the, how it's, from an app perspective, one can make use of that interface if possible. So let's look at some, uh, some just technical details of what we're doing with security check. So, um, so the jailbreak and debug attach detection, we're doing two interesting things. Most, um, most of the books that I described before, um, they actually talk about, they, you know, basically take syscontrol and, you know, make a, make a call to syscontrol and have it check to see if the process flag has been set to debuggable. Um, that typically can be found by the forensics um, uh, sleuth that's looking through your code. Uh, here we actually... We, we, we go down under the covers. We're making actually direct assembly calls below that to read the process flag. And so uh, that's a lot harder to find. And can you imagine if you take that function and you, and you inline that many different places all over your code? So now all of a sudden you have this check that uh, in the past the, re, you know, um, a forensics person could just look for, you know, your check and then what you're doing, like maybe you're exiting or whatever, and then just null out the exit call. Here, um, you know, it'd be much harder to find that. We're also then bundling that in a lightweight thread. So that's a thread that's part of the app. And uh, so now all of a sudden you have these checks that are running when users do things, but then in the background we have these threads that can also be running jailbreak and uh, debug detection. So it, again, it makes it, I mean, obviously the goal of security is that you'll never get to that 100%, but what we're trying to do is slow the attacker, make them work harder um, so that eventually they can get caught or they get frustrated and move on. So forced inlining, um, like I said, this is a recent security control we put up um, on GitHub. And, um, and so the notion, what you're seeing on the left is, is a normal execution where you have, um, a, a, you have a check function um, and then you run some sensitive code, you check it again, you run some more sex, sensitive code, you check it again. And, and when the compiler runs, it's really just going to make a call back to this, to this uh, single copy. Um, and in other words, the compiler is going to you know, optimize all to optimize out all those different functions into this one so that the bad guy simply just has to say, oh, geez, I see that return. Uh, I'll just always return false. So it's a simple uh, way to get around that. One, one, comp one function, you can compromise it all. Um, so with, you know, if you actually forced inline your co code, you now have these functions and you have you know, three different copies of that same code, and the attacker would have to find all three of those and um, you know, return false. So if one kind of zoomed out on the left, um, you can see that it's kind of a small, there's a small haystack with one needle. The, develop, uh, the attacker zooms in on that, makes that one change. One patch is needed of the 232 instructions. Here's a look at the code after we've, we've enforced inlining. And here you have you know, 530 instructions, a large haystack, multiple needles. They're not going to be able to find all those. So, or if they do, it's going to take them a while. Um, so in other words, again, we're just trying to exploit the time, increase the time to make it harder to find these. Switching gears to mobile device management research. So we, we actually have um, we, we've taken and we've um, em deployed an open source MDM server. Um, we forked it from the Intrepidus group. I don't know if folks are familiar with them, but the Intrepidus group has actually built an MDM server. It's open source. We've taken it and, uh, and actually put up a, a nice set of tutorials to kind of follow to get you because there's a lot to do with the certs and getting them all qualified. So what's nice is once, once we have this open source server available, we're now able to kind of um, take a look at the, the process on how this works. We want to try to find the limitations of the MDM spec. 
Um, we want to understand the, the, you know, and test the low-level commands themselves. We ultimately want to try to find out, uh, can we use the MDM interface to do some sort of a single sign-on app? Now, I know iOS 7 has, is starting to provide that, but here, um, here's an open source technique that we're, we're going we're, we're to try to provide. Um, we want to actually have some sort of way to do a remote app lock, uh, a remote app password reset, and perhaps even a remote jailbreak reporting technique. So um, not that we're trying to duplicate what these commercial MDM vendors are doing, but we want to make an open source solution available to developers and uh, small companies or even large companies that want to try to have a little more control over how this stuff works and, and basically be able to add customizations to make it even more secure. Um, because, you know, I mean, if one has a commercial solution and one goes, takes, takes that to a third party, they, um, you, I should say a third party auditor, the audit comes back and it says, well, all these things have to change. Um, you then go to the, 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 um, the commercial solution and say, hey, can you make these changes? And they say, sure, get in line. Um, here you have a little more control of your destiny. Um, so anyways, um, those are some of the possibilities we're looking at. So like I talked about with, uh, with Remail, um, this is a free and open source project that Google acquired in uh, 2010. It's essentially an email client for iOS. It's really, it's kind of cool because it has a very fast way to do search. That, that, here's the front interface for it if you actually open it up and it's got a huge search button. So it's kind of a, a nice way to go in and find emails. But it, it, it's, it's pretty decent for, um, for actually uh, email itself. It doesn't have a calendar or tasks or to-do lists or anything, just straight email. Um, so it, we were noticing in the project site to-do list um, that, you know, quote unquote, security was needed. So we actually took the app and we wrapped it with IMS. Um, so exactly what we did is we, actually, we put a password front end on that, put in the, basically used the security control app password. We brought in data at rest. They weren't using encrypted core data. They were going straight to SQL Cipher. So we just added, um, I should say SQL Lite. So we just added SQL Cipher on top of that. Um, for the runtime, we actually added memory security where we're protecting uh, sensitive information like the user's email and password, um, email address and password. We added in the jailbreak and debugger detection. We've put in the uh, OpenSSL crypto, uh, and we're also using um, the IMAS keychain. And so um, our goal here is this is going to be kind of our test app through this year, and we want to keep adding more of our security controls. We're going to add in the inline function shortly. Um, and in another uh, few quarters, we want to take this to, um, we actually want to hire a third party auditor, have them vet it and tell us uh, different areas that need improvement. So just a little bit about um, IMS Outreach. We're, we are up on the OWASP uh, site under the um, uh, mobile site area. That we, have a, we have a project page. Um, we're listed under the mobile tools uh, section, IMS. Um, we have a um, IMAS GitHub uh, page itself, and then with one gets to this page, you can click on each particular one, and it'll take you into the GitHub site itself. Um, here's an actual look at, um, this is a GitHub repo kind of doctored up to fit onto a slide. But essentially, you're seeing the eight controls that are out there um, all listed in a row. And you can see the various uh, stars and forks that, that are there. Um, and like I said, it's just right now, it's it, it, if, if one considers this an app container, app containers are usually just a single library that you grab and, and make use of. This is more of a, a a la carte kind of thing. You pick what you need depending on your security requirements. And a little more about GitHub. Um, so part of our research, uh, we have to justify, you know, why are we researching and what is our return on invest? What is, you know, my company's return on investment? How will this help our sponsors? And so the big question we get is, well, geez, if you open source um, this, how do we know that it's, you're having impact? Uh, and so that's a good question. And so what we did is we actually found this site called uh, GitHolytics, and they allow you to put a small, essentially inside your about pages on GitHub, you, you can put a small link in there that when the about page is loaded on GitHub, it'll actually go to this GitHolytics site, which then will send the fact that there was a hit to uh, uh, Google Analytics. So it's, it allows us to at least get, you know, pure hit counts of uh, how many times our page has been opened. And so um, that's been helpful because it, as, as I go and ask for more dollars for research, um, I can actually talk, you know, talk these numbers. I can say, well, geez, we, we've had a lot of growth this month. So let's talk about that. And so for the last, this went basically live March 4th for the last eight months. We'd have, we've had over 25,000 unique visitors. 
uh, 30,000 page views, um, most, visits from 108 countries around the world, mostly US, Germany, India, UK, Canada, and China. Um, so for us, for that eight months, my, um, my research sponsors have looked at that and said, this is great. I mean, we, we, I have, they have other GitHub projects. They have other open source projects. And they're, they're not getting this kind of, they're not getting these kind of numbers. So it's more of just a mystery. It's just throw it over the wall and then keep doing your research. Here, we're actually trying to interact and keep the community alive. So with these numbers, we can actually continue to uh, say, hey, geez, um, what else can we do to help and, and increase our community? If you look at the... Um, the big thing is uh, some really neat numbers are the star count. This is the open. This is what GitHub provides is the star notion. So what the stars mean is there's 307 of them. So if you look at all eight projects, um, 307 developers on GitHub have started to say they're interested in it, um, and there's 61 forks. So you know approximately 61 developers had said, uh, hey, this is interesting to me. I'm going to fork this and make a copy of the code. Perhaps I'm going to make changes to it. Um, so that for us is pretty decent in eight months. So we're trying to get some sort of a, a value claim here. And uh, visits and use is, is uh, moderate and steadily increasing. And so this has been pretty useful. So I, I encourage folks, if you have a GitHub um, uh, site out there and, you, and you're trying to you know, elicit some sort of gauge as to usage, check it out. So we have an IMS video. Um, it's a little three and a half minute video. And it's great for someone that sends me an email and says, hey, I'm interested in IMS. Um, we have public release this. It's up on the GitHub site. And it's a quick little um, you know, high level to show a, a general or a VP or a CIO or something like that. Uh, we were written up in Computer World um, back in April 20, uh, 20, uh, April this, of last year. So in the future, um, what else are we looking at? I talked about this a little bit. Um, so we, essentially, we want to continue researching our security controls, you know, those that we haven't finished in FY13. We want to actually um, continue that MDM remote control uh, interface. And so one particular area, uh, so to expand upon that a little bit, in that MDM control area, we've, we've actually found that um, if, you have an, uh, um, if your app is not managed by the MDM server, then, um, you know, then you really can't do much with it from an MDM perspective. And it's, but it's kind of a somewhat of a pain to um, take all these apps and make them managed. So what we thought is, why don't we have one app and have it the single sign-on app, say, uh, and make that the managed app? And so, um, so one could, so in that app, we could put jailbreak detection, we could put uh, the app password, um, and essentially make it your your enterprise single sign-on solution. So, um, and, and that's managed. So that gets downloaded through the MDM interface. And so from there, when a user would log into that, um, we would do some sort of a technique to pass the login information or key over to uh, another app that is part of your enterprise solution. Um, and, th and once that app is launched, we could, pr again, present, um, uh, the user would, would, um, would be able to log in that way. So we're, we're kind of researching. So the idea is that if the MDM, uh, if that sign-on app was, was remotely deleted using the MDM interface, uh, one could uh, basically block access to these other apps by just removing that one app. So it's something that, it's hard to describe, but it's something that we're, uh, we're looking at. It has some interesting promise. Um, I talked pretty much about uh, most of this, um, so I'll just move to the next slide. So what's our end game? You know, wh where are we trying to go? We, we want to get to this notion of secure complete, and that's where we've, you know, all these applicable OWASP mobile top 10 and the, the, the 12 of the 24 uh, mobile threats are, are mitigated to a, to, to a level that we're satisfied with. We'd like, it would be great if the open source site itself was self-sustaining. Um, uh, that is, you know, more and more folks who are contributing, contribute to a, um, doing pull requests and all that. We're seeing that with encrypted core data, but the other controls are, are slowly coming along. Um, we'd like to be able to transition this research to our sponsors, that's the government or, or perhaps even a commercial entity. Um, so I have a demonstration that I'm, I'm, I'm going to attempt. Um, I do have a hardware problem on this laptop for some reason with this connection mechanism that occasionally the screen will just go black. And so we'll just go until the screen goes black. <laughs> See what happens. All right, so drum roll. So far, so good. So this is what you're seeing is the, um, the, app, pass uh, the app passcode security control. We've actually put it together in a small little demonstration app. Um, and so what I'll do is just kind of walk through what you can do. So we'll set a passcode. 
Why not just fat finger it? And if you notice, there's a forget button up there. Um, uh, that's something that I, I've seen some apps that, um, some, some of these type of controls where it's just a simple um, passcode and, and it's, it doesn't think about that forget password. So usually the, if the user does forget it, they have to delete the whole app and reinstall it. So here we have a forget. And what that means is we also provide an alternate key, which is this, uh, these questions. So I'll just make the questions and answers real easy. And so now we're into this, this test app, uh, and you, you can see that once you're in the app, uh, one can then uh, change views and get into the real, um, uh, the app itself. Uh, here we have, you know, we, we show the logout button, um, complete with, you know, pop up, are you sure? So it, they log out, and then uh, we'll rerun it again. And again, remember the first, you know, the whole idea is that we want to try to make it easier for the developers to incorporate these. So. Um, so let's, uh, let's log in again. Actually, let's go with the forget technique. And so what's the question to answer A? It was B, and the answer to C is D. And they say, hey, success, you've, um, you've entered the right one, set a new passcode. So now, and then you're back into the app. Now I know if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, um, if you work for an enterprise company and they have an IT group, the IT group's gonna love the fact that it comes with a password reset because IT helplines hate getting calls about password resets. So again, this is another way to um, increase you know, usage of mobile applications just to make it easier and less uh, difficult for IT groups. Um, so then there's also a reset password, passcode button in there uh, where one can, uh, again, answer the questions and um, great, and then, and then uh, reset it properly. Now, if along the way, um, this actually has the various uh, controls for IMAS in there. So if things like um, if one uh, tries to um, you know try to hack into this in a way like just by uh, doing the forget password and you type in the wrong things uh, you know questions don't match and it just dies it doesn't uh, let the user rerun and rerun it over and over again it makes it a little harder um, so just to give you a, a uh, to do a contrast of that here is another um, free open source uh, passcode app that's out there. Um, it's out on GitHub. And essentially, what's nice about this has an excellent user interface. Um, real simple to use, you can set it. It looks very similar to the old login screens of uh, iOS uh, uh, 6 and 5. Um, you can enter it, change it, things like that. But if you actually look in the code of what's going on here, um, and you, you, I don't know if you're gonna be able to see this, but yeah, you're probably not. But in the code itself, they basically have a single um, uh, password they have a single password um, method that, uh, that they're storing this, here it is right here, this passcode. Yeah, you can't really see it. Um, anyways, it, it's real simple, and if, and if a developer grabbed and took this, they would, they would, the whole back end is, isn't there. Um, looking at, security, uh, at code on the screen is hard to see, so I just encourage folks to um, head over to our site and, uh, and check out IMAS. Um, I have a little more time, so I'm gonna jump to a couple more slides. Um, we actually did a third-party audit of, um, uh, well, actually, let me talk about HReader first. So HReader is a, an, in another MITRE internal research uh, prototype uh, in the healthcare space. So this is a, um, basically an iPad app that uh, allows one to, it's basically an open source patient-focused app. And so uh, you can actually put health, it's a health viewer. Uh, so you want to put your own medical records in there, your family's medical records. So you can imagine the, 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 this information needs to be protected. So um, we were asked to secure this with IMAS. Um, essentially, they asked us to do an audit. Um, you know, they gave us the requirements that HREAD is mostly offline. The application security is basic, needs to be bolstered. Um, what was interesting is that the developers on the project uh, said, hey, we're using um, you know, data protection and we have a passcode. It's secure. Um, so we actually went in there and did a forensics test on this. Uh, we had s synthetic uh, patient data, not real data. Uh, we actually used a, a, a DISA, um, it was a Defense Department kind of uh, application STIG. At the time, the mobile application SRGs weren't out yet, so we used a STIG, basically a big security requirements checklist to take a, uh, make an assessment of the app initially, and then when we uh, did our audits, and then they added more security, and we did more audits. Um, so essentially, um, there was, in this STIG, there was 255 total criteria. Uh, we found that there were uh, 78 were applicable to HReader as a mobile prototype. Our initial assessment was that only 27 passed, or 16% passed. Um, so 
the developers thought it was secure because they had data protection, but under the covers, using all of the different forensic tools, we were able to easily bypass and find the synthetic patient data, which was a data compromise. So after several audits, we got it down to um, uh, 72 criteria passed and only eight failed. So we, in a way, we've increased the security of the, uh, of the, of the application about five times. And, and that's just, you know, using this, the STIG requirements and then, of course, the uh, IMAS security controls. So going back to, um, so that was one, one way to kind of vet out, you know, what are we doing on IMAS and is it effective? Another way was we actually brought in a, uh, a third party company via forensics and they actually took HReader that was bolstered with IMAS and we had them run all their tests on it. Um, and uh, what was interesting is that, like I said, the network wasn't our focus, so they did find a couple of network problems. Um, but they also found the SQLite database key was in memory, and that was a, a slight on our part, so we, we fixed that. Uh, and we had a, at the time, we didn't, have a, we didn't have the right technique to store that key and make that, um, make that uh, more secure, and now we do. Um, so we've mitigated that. Uh, our jailbreak detection and counter debugging worked really well. As a matter of fact, their, their claim was they were going to spend two or three days on this. Um, at the end of day two, they sent us an email that said, hey, could you send us uh, another copy of the app without the jailbreak debugger detection on? Because we were having trouble getting by that. So that was like, all right. Um, and then um, it turns out we got an email four hours later that they managed to find it and, and patch over it. Um, but it, So there we slowed the attacker by possibly three days, uh, which was pretty cool. Uh, so after we, uh, we kind of mitigated this, we, you know, we concluded that we, that we passed the test. But the point is, is that the, the, these controls that are up on GitHub um, have been vetted by a third party, uh, and we plan to do it again. So this is, again, saving labor and effort for enterprises that want to get into this space. Um, IMS does that for you. So one last thing I wanted to show you before I end is that on the site itself, I encourage you to check out each particular control because we actually get into the CWEs of particular um, uh, you know, uh, weaknesses that are out there. So if, if, one, um, so if one has a, um, uh, um, a security architect come to them and say, well, geez, you've got to make sure we cover these CWEs, we meet these requirements, and the developer says, huh? Go into the security controls, check it out. Um, they actually list the particular CWEs that uh, this covers. We actually list the uh, SRG and STIG requirements that are in there that we cover as well. So here it's a nice mapping of, hey, my security guy said I got to do these things. This control does those things. Um, I'm going to use this control. And then, you know, so it's a nice way for um, a, de a dev team to say, you know, hey, um, we've covered these security requirements so that, I mean, ultimately you're, you're probably going to get your app uh, third party vet, uh, vetted again, which is fine. Uh, but, and what's nice is you should be able to say to these, uh, to this third party, hey, we've done all these things. And, um, I think with IMAS, you'll, you'll very likely uh, get a passing grade. Any questions? Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. I appreciate your time.